I'm gonna wrap my arms around my daddy's neck and tell him that I missed you. Tell him all about the men that I became, hoping it pleased him. There's so much I wanna say. There's so much I want you to know. When I find. Experience Life, welcome to week four of a series we've been in called What Happens After You Die. I want to say hello to those of you joining us via video, uh, whether you're at church online, watching on TV, in your home, or if you're at one of our campuses in Amarillo, downtown, just want you to know we're glad that you're joining us uh, today as well. What happens after you die? It's a good question, right? We've been talking about it in this series. Just curious, how many of you guys would say this series has been helpful to you at all? Have you enjoyed the series at all at all of our campuses? Anybody enjoyed it? Anybody? Maybe? A couple? Good. It's been helpful to me just kind of rehashing through this and reminding myself of these things. I think it's very important. But let me remind you of why we're doing this series, why it's so important we do this series. This verse I've been going to each weekend is this. Oh, you surely got it memorized now, right? Like you've memorized this. We've been going over it time and time again. Ecclesiastes, Solomon said this, 7-4. Said a wise person thinks a lot about, all of our camps is a wise person thinks a lot about what? Death, but a fool, while a fool thinks only about having a good time. So at Experience Life, we want to be wise. And so we want to think about death a lot because that's what wise people do. When you think about it a lot, it changes the way you live right now. So we've been talking in this series about it. And we said... <clears throat> Jesus is in a unique position to be able to answer this question, what happens after you die? He could tell us. He could tell us. He was God. He claimed to be God and proved it by doing miracles and rising uh, from the dead. And, and so he has a lot to say about this. So we've been looking in, in the scripture, seeing what Jesus has to say. Basically, we said that Jesus says there's two afterlifes. That there is something happens after you die. You don't just cease to exist. There's two afterlifes. There's heaven. He calls it eternal life, kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom, and hell. Eternal punishment, perishing. You've got these two different afterlives. And Jesus basically said, Where you go depends on what you do with him. That's what we've been talking about. Where you go depends on what you do with Jesus. So we've been doing a little bit about hell, a little bit about heaven each weekend. We're going to do that for one more weekend. This is the finale today. So I hope you'll take some notes. I think uh, you'll find some of what we talk about today is uh, interesting, maybe some things you've never heard before. All right? So let's start with hell. Let's get the bad news out of the way, and then we'll relax, take a deep breath, breath, smile some, and talk some about heaven. Okay, so hell. People have some questions about hell. You have some questions about hell? I'm sure you do. Let me, let me try to answer one of them. This is one. I've already taken some in this series. Let me take another one. Somebody might say, why does the punishment in hell seem so harsh? Right? Like, Chris, I heard you a few weekends ago. I heard you talking about hell. You know, it's a place 
of eternal conscious punishment of unbelievers. I just, I mean, you and you kind of laid it all out. That just sounds kind of harsh. I mean, come on. Like, hell, why, why does this seem so harsh? Let me remind you of something else here. This is huge. If you're taking notes, you wouldn't write this down. you got to remember this if you can ask this question. The punishment for a crime is determined by the magnitude, the magnitude, of the person you commit a crime against. Isn't that true? Just think about it. Punishment for a crime is determined by the magnitude of the person you commit a crime against. We'll come back to that. We'll give you an example. So let's say you go, in the, you go out to the mall, you're shopping in the mall, just doing some stuff, shopping in the mall, and you walk up to somebody and you just hit them right in the face, okay? You just, you just smack them. No reason. It's not self-defense. You're just like, I'm in the mood to smack somebody. You just hit somebody right in the face, okay? That's a misdemeanor. There are witnesses. You hurt that person. You could get in trouble. You're going to be punished for sure for just hitting somebody in the face. But imagine a police officer shows up. They hear about this fight in the mall. And they show up, and you see the police officer say, hey, Mr. Police Officer, hey, Mr. Police Officer, and you hit them in the face, okay? You just smack the police officer right in the face. Punishment is going to be worse. You hit a police, you hit just somebody, misdemeanor. You hit a police officer, immediate felony. And probably in a couple minutes, you'll be on the ground, and you'll feel thousands of volts of electricity surging through your body at the same time. Okay, so, I mean, it's not good if you hit a police officer. Okay, punishment's worse. Imagine you meet the governor, Right? You just go up and meet the governor of Texas. And you're like, hey, Mr. Governor, and you smack him in the face. Punishment is even worse, right? Felony, going to be worse. You're going to have about 10 guys in suits pounce on you. In a matter of seconds, you'll be lying on the ground with your head in the dirt, okay? So imagine, though, imagine, imagine, imagine. One day you get to meet the President of the United States. And you're like, hey, Mr. President, or hey, Mrs. President, and you punch him or her in the face. Ooh, Ooh, punishment even worse. Why? Because the magnitude of the authority of the president of the United States is huge. It's different just punching somebody in the face in the mall. You punch the president in the face, you might get shot in the process, okay? You not only just tase, you might be shot. You get that close. Because of his magnitude. So, so, so think. Think about this. What if you punch God in the face? What if you break God's law? What if you sin and rebel against God? We've all been there. We've all done that. What kind of punishment do you think would come about if you break his law? Because his magnitude is much greater than the president of a country. Much greater. Wouldn't you think the punishment might be kind of harsh? Yeah, and it would make sense. Because it makes sense to you if somebody hits the president, the punishment's harsh. But harsh because it's God. His magnitude is much greater than any earthly leader. So you sin against, I sin against, we rebel against God. We should expect things to not go real well for us because of his sheer magnitude. Now, he's just. So the punishment fits the crime. But I think when we recognize we're the criminals before God, we've broken his law, we think any punishment is harsh. But I think that's a good way to answer this question if you have it or a friend has it. Say, hey, his magnitude is so great. Sinning against God is different than sinning against somebody else. He's God. He's God. Another question people ask about hell. It's a good question. If I know someone on the highway to hell, what should I do about it? You know people, right, on the highway to hell? You do. We all do. If you know somebody... What should you do about it? Let me ask you this question. Say you're driving home from work. <clears throat> Pull into your driveway. You know your family is in the house, your husband or wife, your kids, maybe some friends. Family and friends are in the house. You pull in the driveway and you recognize that your house is on fire. It's going up in flames. What are you going to do about it? I already, know, I already know what you'd do. It's the same thing I do. You'd do everything in your power to rescue them, wouldn't you? You'd break down the door, you'd start praying quick prayers, you'd call 911, you'd be jumping over the flames, you'd be grabbing your kids, you'd be breaking out windows, you'd be dragging people out doing CPR, you'd be calling the neighbors, screaming your head. I mean, I know you, because it's what I would do. Your family's in a house and it's on fire and you can do something about it, you will run into that fire and you will rescue some people. So 
If you know someone on the highway to hell, what should you do about it? The exact same thing. Everything in your power to rescue them. Everything in your power to make sure they understand what awaits them if they continue to remain and ride down this highway. Everything in your power short of sin. Here's some things you might could do. Pray, obviously, a lot, night and day. Don't ever give up. You keep praying. Get other people to pray. Find hundreds and thousands of people to pray. We're talking about a highway to hell, okay? You know what hell is all about. We talked about it. Jesus is clear about it. It's not gray as to how this place is going to be. You get, uh, you get people praying. Invite them to church. They're on the highway to hell. Say, come to this church. This is a different kind of church. And you're not going to be judged when you come. Just come. Just come. And even if you don't believe it, it's fine. You can just come and listen. Or to your group, LTG, or Life Transformation Groups, invite them to a group. Share the gospel with them. Tell them what I tell you guys every weekend. Share the gospel. Hey, good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. And in heaven's for those that believe in Jesus. you got to believe in Jesus. I mean, share, share the gospel. Share your story about how Jesus has changed your life. I mean, everything in your power. Use everything. Introduce them to other Christians. Hey, you got to meet this guy. Hey, you got to meet this girl. Hey, you got to get to know them. Share with them a podcast. It might help them of a... Of a pastor or somebody you like to listen to that you think speaks in a clear way that they would understand. Share answers to prayer. God, answer your prayers. Buy them some Christian music. Get them listening to some of this because sometimes music's real helpful to people and they, you know, it's truth. By the right kind of music, they can hear it that way. Maybe if they don't hear it so well from you, maybe through music. Get them a Bible. Get them one of the Elife New Testaments or get them some books maybe about the Bible if they don't buy into it. Uh, here's what I'm saying. Everything in your, what do you do about it? Everything in your power. You do whatever it takes. You grasp them around the knees and you don't let them go. You don't let them continue down this highway. You do everything in your power to rescue them. Wouldn't it be helpful though, as we talk about this, to hear from like somebody who's been in hell that could really tell us how bad it is. Because maybe it's not so bad. Maybe, Chris, you don't even know what you're talking about. Maybe it's not so bad. Well, Jesus introduces us to somebody that's in hell talking to him, to Abraham in heaven. And he records this. Look, look at this. Look at this. This is interesting. You might not have seen this before. Luke 16, 27. It's this story. is this rich man. And there's this poor guy named Lazarus begged at his gate. And Lazarus ends up in heaven. The rich guy ends up in hell, basically, is the story. And the rich man is not liking it at all. And so here's what he says. <clears throat> he said, please, Father Abraham, he's talking to Abraham in heaven. This is just the story. Jesus setting up this picture to show us how bad this place is. Father Abraham, at least send him, send Lazarus, send somebody from heaven, send somebody to my father's home. For I have five brothers and I want him to warn them so they don't end up where I am. They don't end up in this place of torment. He isn't, this, isn't a, this isn't a joke, okay? This is a guy, Jesus is giving us a picture kind of into hell and a guy saying, hey, this is torment. Please, Abraham, Jesus, whoever, send somebody to warn my family. Send somebody, send somebody to tell my friends. Send somebody to beg them not to end. I don't want them to end up where I am. Please send somebody to warn them. He's saying, do everything in your power. Please do everything in your power to rescue my family, to rescue my friends. I think anybody that's been on that highway and that's ended up there would say the exact same thing. Please, those of you that are living, those of you that are still alive, please see your life as a rescue mission. Please tell my family, tell my friends, don't let them end up in this place of torment where I am. Now, this is not a joke. This is serious. If you know somebody, and you do, on the highway to hell, do everything, everything in your power to rescue them and let them know about what Jesus came to do for them so they can know for sure they're going to go to heaven and be with him one day. Everything in your power, please. Please. That's hell. Deep breath, relax a little bit. Nudge your neighbor. Okay, we're going to do some heaven questions now. Okay, so that, that was the hard part. Heaven. Okay, here we go. A smile. I can see you smile all over campus. There's a smile. Okay, heaven. All right, here we go. Question. <clears throat> About last, some of you have this after last weekend. Okay, you're here last week and you're like, I am confused, Chris. I need some help. Okay, you have to answer this. 
am I really going to be resurrected? I remember you talking about that. Is it, that's weird. Am I really going to be resurrected? If so, what am I going to look like? I'm concerned about my looks in heaven, Chris. Okay. I got to know about this. Okay. Now, in case you're new and you weren't here last week, let me tell you what we said. Basically, we were talking last week about heaven and what you do in heaven. And I said, which heaven? You're like, the only one that there is, I think. And so, and I told you, okay, in the current heaven, there's a current heaven and a new heaven. The Bible talks about you have to go back and listen. But in, in the current heaven, you're still waiting on something. Remember I told you, you're still waiting on something. I said, it's a resurrection. No, not Jesus' resurrection. Oh, you're, you're a resurrection. Oh, yeah, 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 you, you. The Jesus was raised from the dead first, but you're next. And so we're waiting on it. And essentially, I said one day, because when you die now, your soul separated from your body. Soul goes to heaven. Body's buried here. But one day, your body's going to be raised from the dead. You're going to be given a resurrection body. You're going to be reunited with your soul, and you're going to spend eternity with God on a new, in a new heaven, new earth. That was last week in, in 30 seconds. Okay, so you have to listen. So, here, so here's your question. Is that really going to happen? I mean, come on. Are you just joking? Like, am I going to be resurrected? Is that true? And if so, what am I going to look like? So let's, let's look at some verses, okay? So you don't have to just take it from me. It's not just my opinion. I'll show you some things in the New Testament <clears throat> about the resurrection. This is a great passage. If you want to read about the resurrection, look this up. This is Paul. We should listen to Paul. You guys know who Paul is? He's a guy who didn't even like Jesus. He was persecuting Jesus' followers. Then he became one did some miracles, was associated with the disciples. We should listen to him. He's pretty, he's pretty smart. God spoke to him. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15. Let's talk some about this whole bodily resurrection, what we're going to be like. All right. Y'all going to like this. It's cool. It's the same way with the resurrection of the dead. He'd been talking about Jesus' resurrection, and he's talking about our resurrection. You can read the whole thing if you want later. He said our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die. We're buried but they will be, what? Raised, okay? Is there a resurrection? That's what he's saying. Bodies are buried in the ground, but they will be raised to live forever. Like there's gonna be a resurrection of the dead, okay? And believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is gonna happen. You're gonna be given a resurrection body, spend eternity with him on a new earth from last weekend. One of the things you gotta know about this resurrection body is you're gonna live forever in it. It's not gonna be subject to aging. You're like, holla. I mean, it's not going to be, and it's not. And it's not going to wear out. Your body's not going to wear out. It's not going to grow old, okay? It's not. I mean, it's, you're going to live forever in this body. And so I know the question everybody asks is this. So how, if, okay, I'm not going to age. How old am I going to look? Six, 16, 20, how old am I going to look? Most scholars, and again, some of this is speculation, obviously, but based on some of these verses, but we're, we're you know, they're kind of debating it. Most scholars use this phrase, youthful but mature. <laughs> You're like, so what are you saying? Okay, so youthful, like not necessarily a kid, okay? It's not like we're all six. Youthful but mature. So a lot of them, as they're guessing, you know, again, again, it's based on some of this, but it's kind of a guess. A lot of the scholars will say, like in your 20s or 30s, that kind of look. When you felt the strongest, maybe when you were the healthiest, when things were working the best, okay, like 20s, you know what I'm saying? Like 20s and 30s. Okay, now, I said that's just what they say, that that's kind of the age. Youthful, but mature. Now, my daughter, we talk about this. You should talk about resurrection bodies. This is an interesting conversation, especially with a six-year-old, okay? She's like, Dad, here's the thing. I don't care what you're going to look like in your resurrection body as long as your hair doesn't look like this because she's seen my driver's license, okay? <laughs> she said, Dad, I don't care. I don't, yeah, youthful but mature. I get that, Dad. Whatever age, that's fine. Just please, I mean, please. It scares her. She's like, she doesn't know what curly fro. I had a curly fro, okay? I don't know. They Down at the place, they don't change your picture very often. I think I was like 18. I don't know how old I was there. And some of this is, you know, out here in case there's identity thieves. And so, got my, so with curly hair, she just said, Dad, I don't want you to have curly hair. And, you know, she hears me talk about being buff one day and stuff. She's like, I don't want you to be buff either. She wants me to be, uh, I guess, like I am. I don't know. And so, but she doesn't, she doesn't like that. So that's just, but she's cool. She's excited about resurrection bodies just as long as I don't have curly hair. Okay. Another thing about them, another thing about resurrection bodies. Keep going in this passage. 1543, our bodies, Paul says, are buried in brokenness. We get that. Yeah, we're buried in brokenness. But they will be raised in what? Glory. That word often has to do with beauty or brightness. So I guarantee you our resurrection bodies are going to be 
gorgeous. Okay, gorgeous. Some of y'all are like, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I'm getting me a six-pack, all right, up in heaven. <laughs> abs. We're talking about abs, okay? Calm, calm, calm down. Calm down. Okay, gl- glory. So beautiful, beautiful, not stained by sin or evil or whatever effects of aging. Just, t- just as gorgeous as they could be. Keep going. I'm talking about these, what these bodies are going to look like. They're buried in weakness. We get that, right? Your loved ones, maybe your grandma, maybe it's your parents, somebody that you just saw become so weak before they died. This is so encouraging. They're buried in weakness. We get that right before death. A lot of times we're so weak, but they're going to be raised in strength. No longer subject to disease or decay, but fully healthy and fully strong. Strong bodies. That's something to look forward to. Another another text here is Paul again in a different book, Philippians 3. Now, this is cool. This gives us even more information about what these bodies are going to be like. Philippians 3. He says he's going to take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own. Who's he talking about? Jesus. He's going to take our bodies and change them into glorious bodies like Jesus' resurrection body. Well, guess what? We know something about that. Bible talks about that some because after Jesus rose from the dead, remember he was around for about 40 days before he ascended into heaven in a resurrection body. Okay, so here's some of the things we know about his resurrection body. Look at this. He, it looked like a human body. Nobody was saying he was an alien, okay? Hey, look at that alien over there. That's an alien looking dude. Oh, no, I mean, his, in his resurrection body, it looked, it looked like a body, okay? So it gives us some idea what it'd be like. He could eat. We're gonna eat great food on the new earth? I think so. He could drink. He could walk. He could talk. We can have conversations with people. Oh, yeah. But he could do these things in his resurrection body. It looked better than before. It's why sometimes it took him a second to recognize him. Because remember when they last saw him before he died, he looked awful, right? He's beaten and bruised and just in horrible shape. But he looked great. Now it says that he still had his wounds in his hands, his feet, and his side. But other than that, it's kind of a you know, reminder to us of what he's done for us. Other than that, he looked, he looked great in this resurrection body. And here's what's cool, and this is a question a lot of people have had. He was recognizable. In this renewed body, people knew who it was. Again, sometimes it took them a second. But they saw him and they, that's Jesus. That, that's Jesus. That they, knew, they knew, they heard his voice. Oh, that's Jesus. His voice kind of sounded the same. They recognized him. Which leads to the next question that a lot of people ask is this. Are you going to recognize people in heaven? Are you going to be reunited with family and friends that have committed their lives to Jesus? I think, I would say, Absolutely. I mean, because think about it. They recognize Jesus in his resurrection body. Jesus says one day we're going to get to have a meal with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from the Old Testament, kind of like we're going to recognize them. One day Jesus was up on a mountain, and Moses and Elijah appeared, and were talking with him, and the disciples recognized them. Well, that's hundreds of years. I mean, how, how would they rec- They didn't know who those guys were. Somehow they recognized them. I think there's indications here we're going to recognize each other. So you're going to recognize family members that have gone on before you that have committed their lives to Jesus? Oh, I think so. Yeah. And have conversations with them and eat with them and have a great time. Oh, yeah. Family members you've never met? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think so. People from the Bible? Paul? David? Jesus? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're going to recognize people that you've never even seen like a Moses? Would you know that that's Moses? I mean, it seems, it seems like it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what I'm hoping this does for you is just makes you excited. Like I said last week, this may be more familiar than we think it's going to be. And it's going to be amazing. Remember, add up all your best days. Get a thousand of them. Count some twice. And one day, experiencing all of this beats them all. It's something we should just be really excited about. We should think about a lot. For sure. But here's what you got to remember. Maybe you've got this down by now. Where you go? Heaven or hell? Jesus said there's two eternal destinations. It depends on what you do with Jesus. That's not my opinion. I believe that that's true. But that's what Jesus said. I'm not just telling you what I think. What I think doesn't matter. You need to know what Jesus said. He made it clear in a number of places. 
that where you go depends on what you do with him. Here's what it doesn't depend on. It doesn't depend on whether or not you were a good enough person. It doesn't depend on whether or not you went to church a certain number of times. It doesn't depend on whether or not you did a certain number of good things or you didn't commit certain sins or, I mean, come on, come on, come on. It depends on what you do with him, with Jesus. And too often, please, please at Experience Life, if anybody ever asks you again, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? Don't ever say it's about being a good person because you're wrong. It's not. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. It's about what you do with Jesus. We're not that good if you think about it. Come on. The standard for heaven's moral perfection. Are you that good? I'm not that good. Forget what we deserve one day. It's not heaven. It's not. But Jesus came so that we could experience what we don't deserve by taking the punishment that was due us on his own shoulders on a cross. Dying in our place for your sins to pay your fine. <clears throat> so the question isn't how good have you been or how many times have you gone to church? The question is, have you asked Jesus to save and rescue you from hell? because you recognize that's what you deserve and that's what you're going to get without him. Have you asked him? That's called faith. Jesus, I believe you can save me from what I deserve. Would you do it for me? I'm not all that good, Jesus. All of me, I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. I need you, though. Jesus, I believe you died in my place for my sin and rose from the dead on the third day. Jesus, would you rescue and save me? His answer is always yes. You bet. Thanks for asking. That's why I came. So don't trust yourself. Eli, listen, listen. Don't trust yourself to get to heaven. I'm a good person. I'm going, I'm a good person. Come on. You only say that because you don't know the Bible. Trust him. Hey, the only reason I'm going is because Jesus. The only reason I'm going is because I've trusted Jesus to save me. I can't get there on my own. That's the right answer to the question. Some of you today, you haven't committed your life to Christ. You need to today. It's called turning from your sin. Repentance putting your faith in Jesus to save you, not you to save you. You've put your faith in him by asking him, Jesus, would you save me? Jesus, would you rescue me? Jesus, would you forgive me? I can't forgive myself. I can't rescue myself. I need your help, Jesus. We call that turn from your sin to Jesus, committing your life to Christ. If you make that decision today, let us know. There's no more important decision you'll make in your life than to make sure you get your eternity right, your eternal destination sealed. Check, I'm committing my life to Christ on these connection cards. Take it to the next step center at all of our campuses. Let us give you a Bible, a nice, this is a nice Bible, all right? Leather Bible, Old New Testament. It'll help you as you begin to follow Jesus. Make sure you get this right before you leave here today. Let me end the series with this verse again. Please memorize it if you haven't already. Here's the reason we've been doing this. A wise person thinks a lot about death. A fool thinks only about having a good time. You know why wise people think a lot about death? Because if you're thinking a lot about this, it changes the way you live right now. Do you know that? If you only got a week to live, you know it changed the way you live. If you only got a couple days, you only got a month to live, you got a year to live. It changes the way you live. You start living for what matters most you stop wasting your time on worthless pointless things you start thinking to yourself I gotta rescue people I gotta rescue people from what they deserve I gotta tell them what Jesus has done for me you live for what matters when you think a lot about death so I hope even after this series you keep thinking about it you're not afraid of it because you know where you're gonna go that you keep trying to rescue people that you recognize hell really is as terrifying as it sounds you rescue people from it and that you get excited about heaven. You get excited about the new earth. You get excited about your resurrection body. You get excited about being reunited with family and friends. You get so excited about that that you're never afraid again because you know the worst thing that can happen to you is you die and you recognize, oh, ooh, that's gonna be a good day because look where I'm gonna get to go. I'm not afraid of death anymore. I'm not afraid of anything because I know who's with me and I know that when I die, when he decides it's my time to go, 
I'm going to spend eternity in this place, and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be so awesome. Make sure you're going there. Make sure you're going there. Let me pray. God, thanks for this series. This is so important, what we're talking about. God, my biggest prayer right now is for anybody that's on the highway to hell, and they're listening to me right now, they know they're on the highway to hell, that they would get off of it today. Get off. They would trust Jesus to save them. They wouldn't trust themselves and being good enough. They'd commit their lives to Jesus. God, I pray we'd see our lives as rescue missions, trying to rescue people from the highway to hell because we know how bad it's going to be. We don't want our family and friends to go there. And that we'd live so excited about heaven, so excited about one day experiencing all we've talked about in this series. God, you're great. We love you. We thank you for what you've done in our lives and you're going to continue to do as a result of what we've heard. Wise people think a lot about death. God, help us to keep thinking about it because then we're going to live for what matters most. In Jesus' name. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.